the trends in gaming influence all of tech. You and I have worked in gaming for long enough to know that everything we deal with in gaming, then you see three to five years later in the rest of tech. AI, bots, graphics, HUDs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, game development is informing the whole future of everything we're doing. And that's what how I really think of the metaverse at this point, which is it's just games showing you what the future of the internet is gonna look like. In this episode of Building the Metaverse, John Radoff sits down with Amy Jo Kim for a live presentation on Game Thinking TV. Amy Jo Kim was part of the early design team for Rock Band, The Sims, Ultima Online, eBay, Netflix, and Happify, and learned from the inside out what it takes to create an innovative, genre-defining hit. Let's jump into the episode. John Radoff and uh, Amy Jo Kim, thank you guys for, for taking the time to uh, to chat about about these these trends in the game industry and in the metaverse. We have the pleasure of doing it live, so there's always the fun <laughs> the fun challenges of that. But here we are, ready to ready to rock and roll. I'll let John go ahead and kick it off. Yeah, let me let me also just introduce. Amy Jo Kim here because uh, I've known Amy Jo for a long time and Amy Jo is a brilliant game designer, neuroscience background, she's a startup coach, she's working with a lot of companies to help them understand how they can think like a game designer and apply it to their businesses. Um, so this was this was just awesome to be able to team up with you on this this morning, Amy Jo. And I'm John Radoff. Uh, I run a company called Beamable, and I do a blog called Building the Metaverse. And here I talk about game design. And really, to me, the metaverse is all about this future, which is going to be very informed by game design. So this talk today is really for those of you who are building games, game designers, game studio executives, etc. I want to bring to light a few interesting trends that I think you really got to know about this year. But even if you aren't building a game and you just want to understand like, what is this metaverse all about? Start understanding games because it's going to inform the future. So I'm just going to quickly jump into um, a preview of some of the stuff that I'm covering here. And I'm not going to bore you with a lot of slides. We'll go to conversation for the most part. But the preview of the things I'm going to cover are the solo to social trend, the trend of technical to artistic in the team composition. And then the third is this trend towards games, towards economies around games. I'm gonna explain what all that means, but I wanna start with a, with a game that you wouldn't normally think of as social, and that's Undertale. Now, the thing I wanna point out here is that there used to be this thing called social games, right? It was like Farmville and stuff like that. I'm not talking about social games. I'm talking about actually social games, meaning games with social mechanics in them or really interesting communities around them. And Undertale is really cool because it is a single player solo game with an enormous social experience around it. So first of all, how did they do that? I think lesson number one is it's just a super charming game with lots of emotion, great storytelling, a core loop, which is very, very simple to look at, simple maybe in terms of production values, but hard to master, a lot of fun, and it's easy to mod and riff off of, which I think is an interesting lesson from this game. My kids, my, I have two kids, they're 10 years old. They both love Undertale and they love the whole social experience that wraps around it, whether it's watching YouTube videos, whether it's doing fan games, whether it's trying to make their own games and stuff like Game Maker. So there's just this really interesting dynamic community of course, what goes with that stuff like Discord, where Discord helps tie together a lot of these different experiences and you discover what's going on across the community. So this solo to social trend is really important for a lot of reasons. One is that it just builds an enormous community that brings people into your game and keeps them coming back. But right now there's a lot of interesting things going on in the whole ecosystem around games, which is we used to be in this world of customer acquisition costs, CAC being less than LTV. And we're going to this world now of 
it's actually the customer acquisition cost needs to be lower than the network LTV. So what I mean by that, LTV is lifetime value. A lot of mobile games in particular make their whole business around the cost of customer acquisition just being less than the lifetime value. And if you can figure out how to capitalize that, you can grow it all year long. The problem is that now because of changes in uh, the Apple advertising ecosystem, it's a lot harder to target the right players. So a lot of companies are building what they call content fortresses now, and they're willing to actually build, bid up advertising above the cost of even one individual game just to bring people into their network because they're looking at lifetime value as a function of everything that that person might keep doing. So I don't know. I think one of the really interesting things to also look at here is the idle game genre, another one which we think of as primarily solo. This is Cookie Clicker. Yes, that's my actual Cookie Clicker that I've been playing for weeks. Um, but this has become a social experience as well for the same, you know, set of memes and Discord channels and all that stuff happening around it. But you can do things in a game that help bridge the gap. So even if you don't have the the Discord ecosystem and all the memes flying around, you can bridge the gap. A game that I was involved in creating was Archer Danger Phone. This is an idle game where we did a lot of things around events and regular content releases. And that can become a springboard for the social community in your game because it can get them started, brings people back, and then starts to get them involved in the whole ecosystem around it. Um, we're about to work with Eastside Games again, shipping The Office, which is a, a similar game mechanic, idle, but with a very rich social ecosystem around it. So that's the first part that I just wanted to cover. And then we'll move to some of the other things in a bit, but maybe- Yeah, I'm you... eager to hear the other things, but um, this trend that you're talking about, I think it's really worth looking at what's going on and how it impacts not just gaming but other areas and it really sounds like the essence of what you're talking about is that communities aren't really in the games they're around the games and that the community that you're building around your game that the game stimulates is part of the game's ecosystem it's not really a separate thing Oh, I love that word stimulates because I think that's a good way to actually think about this into the game design, like start thinking about how you can stimulate that community around it. Because if you look at Undertale, for example, part of how they stimulate it, other than just the core game design, which was so good, was they really went to their community and said, if you want to riff off of it, if you want to build fan games and memes and stuff like that, they encouraged it. and. I think this is happening more and more. And one of the other trends I'm going to get to when I get to games as economies is how to think of that in actual economic terms, because the value of these networks that you're building, they're incredibly value. I'm going to show an incredible mind blowing example in a moment, um, which is Axie Infinity, just to, to preview that. But um, yeah, you really want to think about social mechanics in your game today are not just the things happening in the game, it's how it happens around the game. And then I think the real opportunity for a lot of game developers right now is bridging the gap. So how do you get that started from the play experience, get them out into the community and then bring the community back in? That's why I talk about things like events and stuff like that, just to drive regular re-engagement. Yeah, most games that are going for high engagement have some sort of live ops live event strategy, that's a big trend. That's really part of the infrastructure that's supporting this overall trend. Quick story. Um, so, you know, I think for me as a game designer, I come out of multiplayer game design, co-op game design, MMO design. And we, of course, the community was around the game, but we built a lot of social features into the game. Recently, when I've been working with uh, game studios, particularly casual game studios, on new innovative games, when we do research, we see so many instances, John, of what you're talking about, which is fundamentally single player games that have these rich communities that have built around them that are essentially metagaming the single player game with multiplayer features. An example is, um, uh, there's a design game 
uh, the name is, is uh, I'm forgetting it for the moment, but it's like a uh, design home. And there's, it's a single player design game, home design game. You make your little uh, rooms and you submit them for prizes. There's a leaderboard, that's about it for social. And we discovered these Facebook groups with hundreds of people in them that had weekly contests. They had their whole own event strategy and the winner would get their picture put in the header of the group. And these people running the group were absolutely running a multiplayer game on top of a single game and having a great time doing it. Yeah, that that is exactly the key trend. It's bringing a live operations aspect into any game. And of course, if you're a multiplayer game or an MMO or something like that, that'll come very naturally. A lot of people assume that if you're building a single player game, that it's really, really hard to add that. It's it's actually gotten a, a lot easier. The tools, the technology has made that in reach of really every game developer to incorporate that into the game design. Let's return to that live ops aspect, but live ops will actually be a theme of everything I'm covering here. Let me just show you a few other stats um, because I think this is another interesting one that goes hand in hand with that. All right, so this is just a stat that I wanted to share with you. This is actually right off of Unity's most recent earnings transcript. So Unity is a 3D engine company. They have pretty overwhelming market share amongst particularly small to medium sized games, especially I think about 8,000 games get shipped a month on Unity. And what John Riccatello observed in this is that it used to be that game developers or the composition of teams rather had this ratio of about one technologist to every artist in the team. Today, it's more like two artists for every technologist. And soon it's gonna be five artists per technologist in the team, according to the trends that they're seeing. And this is what I've just personally seen in game teams that I've either run or been a part of, and a lot of our customers at Beamable, we're seeing the same thing. And I, I think John Riccatello was thinking maybe of an artist as like the graphics person, and that's a big part of it. To me, an artist is also the storytellers, the designers, everyone who's really crafting that experience of the game. So why is this important? Well, I, the whole, what I call the creator economy around games is really evolving. We're way past these earlier eras, which were really about either building your own tool chain, building your own middleware technology, having an engineering team, manufacture and then maintain it for you. We're going now towards the creator era. And in the creator era, it's about those artists and making it easy for them and not constraining them by a whole bunch of, you know, artificial tech constraints, complicated processes that are brittle and whatnot. Now there's a particular game platform that I think everybody has to be familiar with if you're a game designer and it's these guys. Now I'm not saying go build your neck in Roblox. I just really, really think everyone, whether you are at a big publisher or you're a individual indie has to look at what's happening in Roblox because they actually personify some of this creator economy stuff that I'm talking about. It shows the power of what happens when you've got audience aggregation and acquisition combined with a 3D engine that, that works well enough and the development tools all kind of locked together. They've just made it super easy to create stuff so that you know kids can do it. There's kids making millions of dollars in this platform. My kids have sat down with Roblox and, and made some stuff. Why is this relevant? I think that this is actually showing us the trend that's coming here. It's the trend which is if you have these really expensive tool chains and a whole you know, complicated infrastructure that you're constantly managing and you're investing in DevOps and all this you know, complicated debugging, pro all that stuff, like frankly, I, don't, I think that that's gonna hold you back over the next few years. Imagine whether you think of Roblox as a platform that you would build inside or not, think of that as your competition even if you don't really think it is right this second, because it's going to be teams like that with that level of capital efficiency in their content update processes, in their ability to empower this team composition that has five artists for every engineer on it. 
And if you're not prepared for that, you may be investing in a very complex eco infrastructure, which holds you back. It doesn't let you be agile. It, it means that you've got a shorter runway. I think I'm really worried because I'm looking at these billions of dollars that are flowing into game studios right now because it's such a renaissance time right now to be a game studio with all this capital coming in. Lots of people are getting to build their dream games, but I'm worried about the ones that I see like trying to reinvent the wheel, build up a technology stack. I, I think it's going to be like building your 3D engine was 10 years ago. It ends up slowing you down instead of empowering you. That is a great insight. I have to, I too have seen people after the tech angle and you know, people do what they know how to do, right? We all have our superpowers, but I think what you're talking about is really part of this larger no code movement. Yeah. Which is about empowering creators. It's also part of the creator monetization movement. The creator movement of course is huge in crypto. Okay. Everybody drink every time we say the word crypto. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we haven't even said NFT yet. <laughs> oh, you do. Oh, all right. Another drink. Oh, excuse me. Another drink. So, um, but I think that your point, um, you know, the reason we invited everyone in gaming and outside of gaming to this session, the trends in gaming influence all of tech. You and I have worked in gaming for long enough to know that everything we deal with in gaming then you see three to five years later in the rest of tech, AI, bots, graphics, HUDs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Game development is informing the whole future of everything we're doing. And that's what, how I really think of the metaverse at this point, which is it's just games showing you what the future of the internet is going to look like. It is going to look like, but this, I think I'm glad that you brought up no code or low code platforms. I really want to urge every game developer out there to imagine what it's like if they're competing with another team that's no code or low code for a similar kind of product. And imagine what that does to your time to market, your capital efficiency, um, your ability to be agile and iterate and empower people on your team. Because if you're not imagining that, you might be a, a lot longer to market and it might cost you a lot more in a way that is not is not going to work in your favor and we know that game development is a super hard business as is so you got to stack the decks in your favor all right i'm going to hit on the third trend perfect so the third one is i want you to think of games not just as games but as economies the network around your game is like a store of value okay now unfortunately it's hard to figure out how to put it on the balance sheet but here's the controversial piece and it won't be controversial to all of you because some of you have seen this really work. You saw it in games like Undertale, for example, but you don't need to control every aspect of this network, all right? Let's go back to the, the, the economics of games. First of all, for game developers out there, it probably is no surprise that over half of the revenue being generated in games today is coming from virtual goods it might be 95% plus in the next few years. So that's part of the economy of a game, but that's the internal economy of a game. I think it's also important now to look at the overall economy of a game. And just one example I wanted to think about was Axie Infinity. Now I'm not here to talk about Axie in terms of how sustainable is it? Is it a great game design or not? Everybody's got an opinion of that. But I think the amazing thing about it is they created this game with only a 5% take rate. What I mean by that is all the income being generated in this game, which by the way, it's over a billion dollars at this point. This is, this is the first really major NFT based game that's generated substantial revenue. That revenue is actually cycling back in the player economy. It's that fact that's making this game so valuable. All right. I saw this data just this morning. So if you look at the size of the gaming industry, this year it's 176 billion, according to Nuzu. Okay, pretty big, but it's almost double that size when you think of that software plus the hardware and then all that game content IP, but that includes things like streamers, these externalized economies, esports, Discord, all this stuff that's going around your game. 
is part of the economy. And the thing that I feel is controversial to some people at this point is just this notion that if you don't feel you need to control every aspect of that, you're actually increasing the value of the economy. I think that's what Axie showed. That's what Undertale showed. It's this idea that massive value is stored out there in this network. The value will come back to you in the form of franchises and player engagement and, and all that stuff that's important to build a really sustainable business. You don't need to take your percentage on every piece of this. The way I've really been counseling people to think about this is, again, bridge the gap between the in-game experience and the outside experience. Have a regular content train that keeps it updated. You can do that whether you're a multiplayer game or a single player game. And these content updates, they don't have to be like humongous things. It doesn't need to be a whole new level or anything. It'd be little things. It could be one item in the game. And then you can have events that drive real time, that real engagement with your players by having some kind of game mechanic, which is optimized during the events. It uses that new content and the monetization will come. So that's um, just sort of some of the trends that I wanted to share that I, that I think are really important. This is what we do at, at my company, Beamable, by the way, is just help people build this stuff into their games without having to build it all from scratch and just give you the live ops for, for those elements. Yeah, I think that last point you're making is really impactful. And I, I might have a fourth point that's related to it. So it's three awesome. and a half or four. Um, and then by the way, we're going to start taking questions. So if you are listening to this and you've got a comment or a question, shout out Steve and Adam and Joanne. It's great to see you guys here. Uh, we would love to take your questions. So you're talking about games turning into economies. And for me, it's easy easy to think about that as turning into a marketplace because if you're taking five percent of transactions right you have to have a healthy flow of tr transactions to take that five percent and that's a marketplace mm -hmm. so um games have been marketplaces for a while and the marketplace was external like you know gold farming or selling stuff on ebay for world of warcraft yeah. But now you have this idea of a new economic model, which is, it's a marketplace model. And that's really, and Axie is leading the way. Um, I think that uh, you have a somewhat similar model, not exactly going on with Roblox. Roblox is now a very robust marketplace. But the thing that's going on with Roblox, Roblox, and with Axie Infinity that I want to touch on before I tell you my my fourth trend is that same thing going on with every crypto project, which is that most of them are going to fail. A few will succeed, but um, there's a lot of free to like okay. free to play free to play gaming like Axie Infinity. That game's been going since 2018. It only spiked in mid 2020. You know, it's Roblox was in development for seven years before they really got, you know, building platform going. So these things don't happen overnight. And looking at Roblox and saying, oh, we want to be Roblox. Oh, we want to be Axie Infinity. It's really important to understand the development that went into that. And that if you're building a marketplace, that's just order of magnitudes harder to get the flywheel going. It takes a while than say a hit game. Yeah, I mean, I think Roblox came into the common consciousness over the last 18 months or so as like an overnight success. I mean, the seven years you're referring to is even like, I mean, I think it was like 15 years to build yeah, Roblox. Yeah, since it was founded. We were, <laughs> yeah. So right. I mean, what, what can people do to lay the foundation for that, you think? Is that um, your fourth idea? So the fourth idea is a thread that's been running through this whole conversation and I call it community first game dev. And mm -hmm. the best example of this right okay. now is the loot project. Raise your hand in the comments if you've heard about the loot project in crypto. So um, 
<laughs> let me tell you very high level and briefly, this is a very deep rabbit hole we could go down. So there's a lot happening in crypto, 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 take three drinks. Um, that challenges uh, assumptions that a lot of us hold about how you do quality work, right? It's a lot of bottom-up mm -hmm. decentralization, self-organizing systems, etc. And the Loop Project is a high-concept project created by one of the co-founders of Vine. So created by an existing internet influencer with a body of work and a reputation. And they minted um, a limited set of text gifts with a list of, I, I believe it's eight items that are a semi-randomized set of items that you might find in an RPG, right? Or a game like that, armor, etc. And a community of people excitedly gathered and started imagining together what games could be built on top of this seed. It was, and they were all minted as NFTs, tradable, etc. So now there's a group of thousands and thousands of people eager to see this come to life. It started with the suggestion for in-game objects of a limited set. That's it. And that's community first game design. And the, the way to tug this thread is to say, what if to figure out what game to build, you started with gathering a community of people really excited about it. And then you basically built the game in conjunction with them. There's been versions of that going on for years. I do a lot of that work in a version of that work, right? A lighter version of that in our programs. I watched up close Will Wright, way back on The Sims, getting in touch with these super fans pre-alpha and really just interacting in ways that help you understand what the game should be. This is this on a massive scale. Yeah, loot is really interesting. It, 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 they're actually fulfilling this prediction I made earlier this year, which is that we would have this idea of a digital collectibles first game company where really they make the collectibles and the game kind of emerges out of that. In fact, he sees the community actually building the games on top of that, which is, which is super interesting. But I think the deeper piece underneath that foundationally is the, this idea of embracing the community and like co-creating with the community. It, to me, it goes back to the thread that even started with stuff like Kickstarter, crowdsourcing, building up your community and working with them before the game or the project gets made. And of course, MMORPG companies were some of the first that were really good at this, building community over many years. I don't know if they were as always good at the co-creation aspect, but now there's a lot to be learned from this. So I really love that idea. It goes through everything we talked about. It's about re-engaging your community, bringing them back in. It's having that social ecosystem that's going to build out from your community. Um, and even they become it, some of the artists that we're talking about, right? They're, art, they're actually putting content back in. That's, that's what the trends with modding and extending game experiences. Right. And I think it's very deeply related to the rise of influencer culture. That's been one of my big ahas is really understanding loot never would have happened if the person at the center of it wasn't an internet celebrity. It just wouldn't have. And yeah. that's part of community building online is um, people to rally around because communities really are aggregations of people. You know, even if you have lots of smart contracts, people have to write the contracts and then, you know, do stuff in the real world that conforms to them. And as we all know, just because there's a contract doesn't mean people will honor it with their actions. So True. Uh, it's a it's a really interesting trend. I, so let's talk about the lessons for everybody. And let's I know that there's been some questions that came in even before this from our Game Thinking Hub, and I'll answer those as well. But um, we will be taking your questions. Love to hear what you think about this. So the lesson for me is that 
social gaming is all gaming. If you're building a single player game, the way people play it is going to be connect on the internet, at least many of them. And you don't have to build all of your social features into your product from the ground up as a game dev, as a product developer. You can use tools like Beamable to not reinvent the wheel, right? Especially on the back end. You can also use existing tools to gather people together. And, you know, you may not even have to build features into your game at all that you thought you had to because we all live in this ecosystem and you don't have to just look at your games going out in the world, your product shipping in the app store. You can really look at the internet ecosystem of social products. And if you understand where do your people gather and how can you bring them together to make them feel like they're part of the development, whether it's a tiny bit with dev diaries and updates or whether they really are part of the development with, you know, uh, token and governance ownership, right? Making your community feel and be to different extents, part of the development of your product or game is the new way. And I don't think that trend's going to be going away. Absolutely. Yeah. So I would really urge everyone to think about community, the solo to social trend, all these things that we've been talking about game economics is part of their thinking whatever kind of game you're making, like don't just assume that your single player game won't benefit or frankly won't need this kind of stuff to be successful in 2021, 2022. Um, there's some resources that you can look at. I, first of all, definitely subscribe down below in the video here and become a part of game thinking as a community. There's a ton of stuff like this that Amy Jo is putting out for startups, for game developers, um, that's a resource you should definitely check out. Follow. Oh, we have some questions. <laughs> um, yes, please do. And um, we have some questions coming in. Uh, Moisha asks, learn to play game. You mean play to earn. Learn to play. I love that. With a play to earn <laughs> game like Axie Infinity. Is the game experience that drives it and the ability of the player to profit from it is that what's the engaging loop? What a great question. Let me answer it and then I'll have John take a crack too. So uh, we're answering it from, we're not complete experts, but we're both learning. So from what I see with Axie Infinity, it's a combination. And I mentioned this in our recent video on Axie Infinity. If you haven't seen that yet, we'll link it um, as part of the description. So here's something really important. The game itself has depth as well as simplicity. Now getting into it, you have to set up a raw, a wallet and that's actually onboarding is kind of tricky, but the game is like Pokemon meets crypto kitties. And uh, there's a lot of familiarity with the battle mechanics that people who know those genres will go, Oh yeah, I can do this. And it's actually got enough strategic depth with its card mechanic, which is very similar to collectible card game mechanics that, you know, people that are good at it do better, right? So the game itself is fun enough to play and engage you and like keep you busy and your brain engaged. So that's thing number one. And it's really important because a lot of people think they can just knock off Axie and the gameplay doesn't have to be that good. And I disagree. I mean, you, you'll do something, but it won't be lasting. That's what you need if you want deep retention. Number two, the earn part is huge and it varies for the people. Axie came to prominence in 2020 because rural Filipinos who were laid off from their taxi, taxi driver and shopkeeper jobs were making enough more money that they made at their jobs in Axie Infinity. The economy has changed now. It's harder to make money there. But there was a point where it was astonishing what was happening. And then now there's a it's a bigger economy. That game has processed over a billion US dollars in transactions. I mean, real, you know, real money happening. Um, they're continuing to develop it. They have some new gameplay around land ownership coming out, et cetera, et cetera. But the, for some people, 
they're playing Axie specifically to earn money. They might be needing to make rent. There are people that need to make rent and Axie letting them earn less is a problem. That's it. I mean, that's the risk yeah. of play to earn gaming. There's also people that are playing Axie in a much more speculative way, buying Axies, renting them out, blah, blah, blah. And they're really playing a long game with Axie. So there's like a short game economically. Can I make my rent this month? And there's a longer game, whether the whole game is actually a viable digital nation. It remains to be, but the punchline is, it's the bringing together of the ability to earn money with really compelling gameplay that gives you the magic. Yeah, the game has to be good. I mean, we've we've seen speculation in games way before any of these digital products. Magic the Gathering had speculators on cards. Pokemon had speculators on cards. So, so that in itself isn't particularly new. I think maybe the getting some of that money back out of it more rapidly is pretty new because you used to have to, you know, buy the Black Lotus and hold it for 20 years <laughs> to, to make a lot of money in Magic the Gathering. Um, but it does require a core game that's really fun. Like that's the same thing in Undertale too, right? Like all these wonderful things around memes and videos and animations and fan games and stuff. It wouldn't have happened if the core game experience wasn't inherently fun. So it does start there. I, I worry about like the crypto game projects that are getting started right now where they think that they can ship something, you know, very superficial fun factor, because I don't think that's going to cut it when we get to next year. But that's the same for any game. But I think the lesson to bring it back is just like, yes, make a fun game, but think about your community, think about engaging them, think about about them really early on in the development process and think about ways you can socialize the experience of your game. You don't have to build a crypto game. I'm not here to teach you to build crypto products. If you want to do that, go for it. I celebrate you, but most of the world is going to keep building, you know, traditional games for a while. And I think you really do need to think about incorporating the social systems around it that can give you real sustainable uh, games, but also a sustainable business. Absolutely. So um, we got a bunch more questions. Moisha, we'll get to your second question in a moment. Adam Chalmers, hey, shout out, says, talk about the play to earn pitch of games that are trending right now. Do you, you know, have thoughts about that, John, before I jump you know, in? Other I games just... that are trending? Well, um, <laughs> the games that are trending that are saying that they're play to earn. So let, let me yeah. jump in and tell you what I know. So okay. um, Axie Infinity, because it it hit these big milestones, dollars in transactions. Oh, by the way, Axie Infinity, they have insane retention, which again is a combo of the earn and the gameplay. If, uh, if their economy changes and you can't earn as much, the retention may be quite a bit lower. That's something that happens. But because of that success, just like always in the gaming industry, uh, there's a bunch of copycats jumping in and there's a, especially because it's the combination of gaming and crypto, you're getting a lot of, this is the next big opportunity in play to earn games, get in early, blah, blah, blah. Now, one of the biggest problems with the whole crypto thing is the get in early pitch, because it's very easy to use that for manipulation and for rug pulling and all the kind of stuff that you see around around everywhere. So that is a tell, I would say. Um, but what I see, if I look, you know, if I log into YouTube or I look on my Twitter and I talk to people, um, I see a lot of people in the gaming industry and outside of the gaming industry, finance people, seeing what's going on, looking at the numbers and then wanting to jump in, wanting to brand their gameplay to earn, wanting to, you know, jump into that bandwagon. And so for me, I've actually turned down several gigs that were basically copycat play to earn with a twist because it didn't make sense to me. Now, I'm sh here's the thing, just like we said earlier, a lot of these are going to fail. A few of them will probably break out. Yeah. I mean, one game I'd take a look at that I've been keeping an eye on and it hasn't released yet. So it fits into that, um, 
you know, get in early aspect, but I think they are doing a bunch of the things we talked about in terms of trying to build their community in advance of launch. Um, Star Atlas looks super interesting just because they purport to be building like a triple A quality game, which by the way, is I think the direction that crypto games are going, you're going to see much higher production values, a lot of the game experience that you're accustomed to in MMORPGs and AAA games and stuff like that. So maybe, this is like so, a, yeah. So yeah, I completely agree. A lot of AAA devs are jumping in, but here's the thing. Axie Infinity runs on low end smartphones. Yeah. And that, well, I would, I would say that it's a good game for mobile too, like mobile you know, I've built a bunch of mobile games. It doesn't always mean build AAA graphics, but it does mean build a really tight experience with tight game loop, all of that stuff. Star Atlas is going for something a little bit different. It's not targeting the mobile world. It's going for more of the PC gamer who really likes strategic war games in space. So it's a different demographic. I, I think we'll see more things like that emerge. And maybe we'll see th more things like loot where they start with the items and then let the community build gameplay around it. So there's going to be a ton of super interesting experimentation around this. I like your phrase collectibles first game design. I think that's really interesting. All yeah. right. So, um, uh, we have another question from Moisha. Are the NFT assets and third-party ecosystem economy fit, as in product market fit, what sus creates the sustainability? Those are features. Those aren't product market fit. Like NFT assets and an ecosystem economy are, are aspects, dynamics, features of a game. Product market fit is when people, I mean, Axie has product market fit. And if you look at their stats, oh my God, it's like, you can see when they hit it. Um, product market fit is when what you are building, lots of people want it and they vote either with their attention money or whatever it counts, right? So um, lots of people have floated NFT sales that weren't successful. Some people have floated NFT sales that are massively successful. Some of those sales had product market fit and some didn't, right? But the question about what's sustainable, that's the question about all of this. Is Axie's economy sustainable? It's completely dependent on new players coming in and spending money right now. They need to develop different uh, money sinks that existing players can spend as well, which is, I think, a lot of what the land is about. Um, so it depends, you know, is it sustainable? Are NFTs in their current form sustainable? You know, lots of them probably not, but is there something going on overall with the economy driven kind of gaming that John's been talking about with NFTs being key tokens, um, you know, with tokens, which NFT is a example of, you know, Chris Dixon recently wrote a thread. He's at A16Z saying, making an argument that tokens are to web three as websites were to web two. Like we didn't really have websites before 1995. You did if you're in a university, but there was this huge explosion with not the internet that had been around for a long time, but the web, which meant it got really accessible. And I do think that um, tokens, including NFTs are fundamental to how we'll be living our life digitally online. The ways in which they're gonna do it we're all going to invent them together. Yeah, I, I think there really is something to this whole idea of decentralization, which is part blockchain, part open source, part just empowering creators to make more stuff and own your own destiny online. But to be clear, like the message you should take away from this isn't go and build a, a play to earn game, unless you want to. If you want to and you're inspired by that and excited, go for it. I think there's lots of interesting opportunities there. I think there's a lot of legitimate questions around how sustainable that will be on an individual game basis, what the mix of players that are there for the joy and play experiences versus people that are there to either be speculators or to participate in the economy, which may or may not be your definition of playing a game for fun. 
we don't know that yet. It's still so early. The message here, though, is to really look at what's going on in the economies and the communities of these games, because I think that the ones who have been successful, number one, they were very masterful in building the social bridges, building the community up around the game experience. And number two, I just want to return to that controversial point I tried to make earlier, which is think about not caring so much about extracting your share of revenue out of every part of that community. So you want to encourage all of these things to happen, whether it's esports, streaming, or even market-based economies like they have that, that they've achieved in Axie, because it's the fact that that network exists and it's very authentic and the community is embracing it and that they're finding their own ways to re-engage that comes from them making content and adding to it and socializing and connecting with the other players gives enormous sustainability. And that network is a store of value in your company is incredibly valuable. Like that is what the companies of the future are going to be doing. So we have a bunch more questions that came in and a hard stop at nine. So let's do some rapid fire. We got Paul okay. Stefanik. Hey, Paul, um, from across the pond. So he asked, is play to earn really play? Hmm, good question. It seems like a very different motivation. Almost every definition of play is centered around intrinsic motivation at some level. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I think that some people are doing it as a form of work and some people enjoy their work and hopefully they are, but I don't I don't know if it fits in a classic definition of play. But I think a lot of people are also playing it. Like when I go to some of the games with NFT based economies and I buy in, I'm there because I'm really interested in investing in a character or an experience and build it up and, and do something unique. So I think there's people like me out there as well, but I don't know what the proportion of that form of interaction is versus the play experience. Um, I don't get so hung up on definitions of, you know, what quote unquote play always has to mean though. I do think there's a really deep point in this question that I want to highlight and then move on, which is that extrinsic rewards shape your human experience in a way that intrinsic motivation doesn't. Um, I have some material on this on my channel. You can go look at that. But in essence, it when you're motivated by extrinsic rewards like play to earn, if that's your main motivation, you are in a different mindset. It's gonna, it's gonna have less to do about creativity, more to do with task completion, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think there's a shift. But John, as John said, some people play to earn and enjoy their and enjoy their game. Some people are like the stock market. Some people the stock market's their job. Some people are desperately trying to make rent. Other people are playing it like a game with their play money, right? There's different motivations, but that is really a great question. We also have uh, Eric Jolner. What about money winning competition games? Like esports, I assume? Yeah, I mean, to me, that's just another form of extrinsic motivation to just continue at that point. Even without money, though, I think it's also important to recognize that the reason a lot of people engage in these external social ecosystems is for things like social status. Social status is an extrinsic motivator. If I'm the person who gets famous on Twitter or Twitch or whatever, like that's an extrinsic motivator as well. So I, I think the reality is that we're in a world now where games are such a big part of people's lives that there is this continuum between like the core play experience where it is intrinsic and you're just there for the fun of it and of this meta experience that surrounds the game, whether it's a marketplace like Axie, whether it's becoming a Twitch streamer or being the best person in an esport there's extrinsic motivators that are present. And I think it's not a negative to understand what's going on with that. It's actually a positive to understand those external forces because there is something to this idea of socializing beyond the game and building the community that can really carry your game forward. And those people are, are important parts of your community. Right, and different people want different kinds of gameplay. Like you mentioned earlier, there's the PC, strategy gamer they want a particular kind of thing somebody else wants something fun on their mobile 
people in the rural Philippines want something their phone can run that's not going to make their internet bills crazy, right? It's like yeah. people want different things. So we have uh, Piyush. Hey, uh, Mahajan asking, what are your thoughts on gamifying habit forming apps using NFTs as the rewards? Okay, everybody drink. <laughs> well, what do you I, think? What answer is I have no idea what you're talking about, but um, are you, is the question about? Like, I think it, the question. Let's let yeah. So <laughs> that's like you know, take this thing and shove it into this other thing, and then say, what do you think of that? It's like I think I think here's what I really think. I think all of us are still figuring out how to use NFTs. I think non fungible tokens collectibles, whatever you want to call them, are going to be used in a wide variety of ways. Um, the problem with habit forming apps isn't that the reward isn't there. That is actually, I think the real issue is that question is actually solving the wrong problem in a sense. I mean, there will no doubt be a habit forming app at some point that uses NFTs as rewards. But check with me in five years. Let's see if there is one or has been one, right? Probably there will be, is. absolutely. But the, the issue with habit forming apps is not that the, re, like the rewards aren't juicy enough. If you use extrinsic rewards with habit forming apps, there's ways that backfires over the long term. And I talked about this recently in a video. There was a study that showed that people that were externally rewarded for losing weight did lose weight, but they gained it back much faster than the people that weren't during a study. There's an example. I, I, th I guess the question is like gamification. Is it, It's a gamification question, which is how do you use game mechanics to make something that's not a game fun? And the, that's the problem I have with that whole concept of gamification, which is that just adding a reward system or a leaderboard or something or a point system on top of something that isn't fun doesn't make it suddenly feel like a game. If you want to make it feel like a game, make it immersive, make it emotional, give people an aspiration, like that'll make it much more game-like in a very much, much more authentic way. That said, super hard to do because I think it actually is a grand challenge to bridge the gap between um, that which is not fun and suddenly just make it feel fun. Right. Um, and somebody else uh, asked about our program. So in our programs, and if you go to gamethinking.io and click on programs, you'll find out more. We help you do this. And I'm not going to lie. It is hard. It's way harder than throwing some mechanics at something, but it's much better. And the secret is you start by really understanding the people you're designing for. That actually gives you the clues to do the smart version of motivational design, which is what we're really looking for. So another question from Adam Chalmers, watching what the sandbox is doing, kind of Roblox plus Minecraft with land ownership. So yeah. like, that's like a bunch of trends all together. Are you aware of the sandbox? Are you tracking that, John? Yeah, um, it's interesting. Uh, I. Not a lot of people have been able to do a lot with it yet, so I, I can't really firsthand explanation of it. But yeah, it's trying to bring essentially the second life economy. So the second second life, in many ways, like one of the first metaverses because it's a creative platform, um, had an economy that was based on land ownership and then transactions between players for content. Sandbox is trying to use a voxel based kind of like a Minecraft type um, game system with that same kind of economy. So if you build that kind of economy, what's implicit in it is that land is valuable because it's close to something else that people want to see. And that would be generated by traffic and people moving by it and seeing things. And then if you're close to the popular thing, you'll be, get noticed. It's essentially the way real estate in the real world works. I just don't, the answer is maybe that'll work if they are a super popular platform. Um, I don't know if it's the right economic structure ultimately in a world where virtual property can be manufactured in an unlimited amount and there won't be just one sandbox. Like a bunch of people are trying this land ownership. There's Decentraland, for example. There's a bunch of these things. So it's not even like you have one world. There's unlimited
worlds with unlimited real estate in them. Um, but sure, if, if one of them generates tons of traffic, which none of them have at this point, then that real estate could have some inherent value. Awesome. I well, like I the think simplicity the simplicity of Oxford based system. You know, the overall issue of how you construct rares and limits and constraints in a digital world is again, something we're all grappling with. It's part of why Loop Project is interesting. It's part of why NFTs are both interesting and problematic of our time. Thank you, Josh and Cassandra and Scott for helping us. You know, the team make the teamwork makes the dream work. Thanks Absolutely. for your great questions, everyone. So glad to be here real quick. Amy Joe, could you tell people where they could follow you on Twitter? Yes, I'm Amy Jo Kim, A-M-Y-J-O-K-I-M. And by the way, we'll put links to what we mentioned in the description of the replay of this live. So you can find it easily. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. And John, can you tell us where we can find you? Uh, yeah, I'm Jay Radoff on Twitter. You can follow me there. I write about this stuff about every week on my Building the Metaverse blog, which just go to my Twitter. You'll find it easily. And my company makes this some of this live operations infrastructure so that if you are trying to master this solo to social trend, we can help you do that very easily. I think I speak for everybody when we say thank you so much for, for taking the time to to share this info with us. We, we really appreciate it. I do want to encourage everybody that's listening live, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. If you're listening after the fact, please do the same. And uh, we will see you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm grateful to everyone who came up with questions.